my dad looks obviously very content and really happy and for him this is the place that he's from and um you know he often spoke about how when he dreamt he his dreams were sort of based or located in India or Pakistan and you can see he's just adapted back into the culture really easily and smoothly and you know he's sitting in his sort of squatting style on a little chair called a bidi and he's wearing a dhoti which is just a simple cloth that um, men would wear for comfort over there and um, yeah the process of sort of going between cultures which had always which has always been very difficult for me I think it's quite interesting to see how he he just sort of switched from one to another with relative ease. An erratic is the name given to a rock that's uh, a large rock usually that's been carried across the landscape sometimes for hundreds of miles frozen into a glacier, it's picked up from its point of origin and then carried across the landscape. And then eventually when the glacier um, melts, it's deposited in, in a, a sort of strange and usually foreign landscape. And the term was quite appropriate to describe, I suppose, the life of a diasporic artist or people who are diasporic, that they've been the, they've been picked up and and taken many miles away and having and then they're deposited in a in a uh, in a strange and foreign land and have to adapt at some point somehow because my mum was a seamstress and she worked from home we all helped her in the evening sort of around our school day and uh, and we ended up all developing very good dexterous skills because we'd be doing things like cutting threads or turning collars inside out, ready for her to sort of sew together. And then that uh, meant that when I went to art school, those were the skills that I had. It was the manual making that led me into working with ceramics. And even though I tried to resist it at art school, because I felt it was quite a sort of Mm, almost like a feminine and very domestic uh, pursuit to be working with clay. And I actually wanted to be working much more with wood or metal and using machinery and, and making work that was much more sort of physical and probably more masculine as well, just to break away from those stereotypes, really. Um, but eventually, I just came back to clay because I felt that it was really great for working with hybridity in a sense because uh, you could process this multiplicity of thoughts and references that you had because very quickly and immediately because there's a very sort of short distance between thinking about something and actually making it directly and that's why with something like Metropolis for example all the objects were quite small and made within the facility of my own hands and all the sort of points of reference and all the research that I'd done whether it was into uh, sort of European art or European design or things that I'd seen on the street or whether it was um, uh, sort of cultural references from my inherited culture, all those I was able to merge very directly and immediately just through, uh, just through working within the facility of my own hands. So horror vacui is a term that's quite often used to describe use of pattern and ornamentation in non-Western cultures, a term that loosely translates as fear of empty space. And it's in direct opposition to Western minimalism, which is the education that I received at art school. At the V&A, I tried to bring together these two opposing languages, uh, aesthetic languages. So taking uh, the Villa Muller, which was designed by the Austrian architect Adolf Loos, uh, who was a 
fierce proponent of minimalism uh, and then completely covering it with ornament and uh, decoration um, using the language of horror vacui. Because of these two disparate ways of working that I developed, the tile work on the one hand and then the sculptural work that I'd left behind, I ended up with two very separate ways of working. So I tried to merge the processes by applying industrial processes to the sculptural work and, and then applying manual processes to the industrially produced elements of the work. The result was uh, the formal language of the sculptural work um, but actually the techniques and processes that I developed through um, research conducted during my, um, uh, during my commissioned work. And these are sort of modular pieces. So I was using water jet cutting to cut uh, quite complex forms into the industrial tile modules and then overlaying them always with uh, a manual process. So that meant overlaying them quite carefully with uh, multiple layers of glaze. The glaze obviously only develops during the firing. So when you're overlaying glaze, you have to have a knowledge of how a glaze is going to appear post firing. So I've got this sort of ability to retain memory of colour in my mind. And there's this sort of careful placing of elements to make sure that colours are juxtaposed. It's never about um, harmonious colour, it's never about creating sort of complementary colour particularly. The interest has always been in having a broader colour palette as possible and really working with that to create not a sort of, not a jarring but something that sort of works against each other. The tableaus for me still carry that sense of awkwardness and being this sort of almost like a disobedient object, you know, it doesn't really fit within any parameters of, uh, of categorization. And I think because they're in landscape format, often they're read as uh, architectural groupings and the sorts of groupings that you might find, say, uh, somewhere in India, for example, where you have architecture from many different time periods juxtaposed against each other. So sometimes you might see uh, a steel skyscraper with, uh, which is being built with um, bamboo scaffolding, for example, and that could be um, a sort of shoulder to shoulder with uh, a Hindu temple or a, a small shack selling sweets, for example. And those sorts of juxtapositions are really common in places like India or Pakistan. It's the language of a sort of metropolis, so it's, it's the man-made world. So um, often referencing arch architecture from around the world or uh, the designed objects or quite often anthropological collections. but also beginning very much with their roots in the v &A collections, so objects that I'd seen in the collections at the v &A. One of the most interesting objects for me was a daybed. Um, and this is obviously a very curious object for the, for the Indian craftsman because in India, people would just naturally sleep on the floor on a rug or a blanket or something. Um, and so, it would have seemed really odd to understand why a European would sleep on a on an elevated, quite narrow um, bed, and the proportions of it are very strange and very and extremely elongated. Because I think the craftsman probably supposed that a person would lie down and uh, sort of fully on this day bed rather than just propping themselves up. A sort of a slippage in a way in the understanding of the way that this object is going to be used. And similarly with the wooden objects in the exhibition, they came out of a 
a desire to move away from uh, the tradition of making directly in the crafts. So the idea was that I would recreate the process of, of creating these one of these objects or maybe a set of objects between between India and England and I was quite interested in the translation that would occur. Just seeing what happened in the process and how, how these were translated by a maker in another culture and but also being quite aware of the fact that actually I as a hybrid person have a I have a particular set of hybrid aesthetics already and that actually I'm just by sending the work across to India to be made that I would just be amplifying this hybridity. Eventually I came to the realisation that actually I was the sort of hybrid component in this equation and whether I went to somebody in India to to, re, to make the work or whether I tried to find a, a maker here, in a way the, the translation uh, could, um, could be quite similar. So eventually I found a maker here, quite local in Woolwich, to work with in London. Eventually I realised that I could divide conventions of making that I'd been educated within, so the conventions of craft for example, by using materials that were already ex in existence. And in Sweden I started to try and find materials in, our, in my environment and I spent a lot of time visiting uh, DIY stores in Sweden because for me the DIY stores were almost almost like an anthropological collection because it actually told they told me quite a lot about Swedish culture and ways of living because in Sweden there's this sort of long tradition of self-building and it's also a seafaring culture and because there's such a a huge coastline, so many people have boats and so some of the materials that I chose were rope but also uh, quite readily available sort of ubiquitous building materials such as um, lagging, pipe lagging or uh, drain pipes. In working with these um, industrial materials and working sort of more economically as well and directly, I was also, I suppose, making reference to um, some of the architects and designers that have influenced me in the past. So people like Enzo Mari, for example, who works with the real sort of economy of means. He tried to sort of design objects that put uh, the power of making back into people's hands. Um, and then also some, you know, people like Buckminster Fuller, for example, who was a real environmentalist and again he designed with, um, mo with modularity at the heart of his practice to, na to enable people to build things economically and also to self-build and those ideas were very important have always been very important in my thinking. It was very interesting for me to be able to start working with modularity and with industrial ready-mades. And so one of the objects that I made at for the Pier Show, instead of tile as the modular component, it's using industrial lagging. And this is something that I, I sort of came across incidentally. You know, when you see this lagging as a multiple, it starts to take on a sort of decorative quality. It's got a reflective surface, so there's a sense of movement to it. But also, um, there is this real sense of inherent ornamentation in the material, despite it being so industrial. It's a continuous, almost like a, a never-ending object piece that works around the aperture between the two gallery spaces, so it's visible from both sides. When a person lands in a new culture, there's this tendency to either um, adapt or resist or sort of rewrite uh, aesthetically the culture that they're within and I think in the West there's this real tendency to sort of delineate practice uh, and think about categories within which you would work and I 
feel that I've never really worked in any of those categories. I ended up in ceramics, in the world of ceramics, quite accidentally because I was good at making with my hands, but never really felt I fitted within that. And I never looked at the history of ceramics. I always looked at anthropology for my references and anthropological collections. A lot of the work in the exhibition has come from, it's sort of almost like finding strength in the making of the awkward objects and finding an excitement in making objects that don't fit particular categories. It's a sort of almost like a, a sort of writing back that post-colonial writers would do, speaking back to the world of craft and the world of art, which is about just wanting to just get on with the business of making rather than having to explain yourself through uh, always through biography or your roots or your identity.